rising slowly from the mist, headlights flash and engines rumble. You're about to enter a world of strange and exotic automobiles. Hear stories of triumph and defeat, and weird tales of the mysterious, the bizarre, and unexplained twists of fate. These are the Ghost Cars. And now, here's your host, Adam West. We've just arrived at the bizarre Winchester Mystery House here in San Jose, California. It's the mansion that once belonged to Sarah Winchester, the heiress to the bloodstained Winchester rifle fortune. Later, I'll be telling you why her house is so strange and what's so unique about the garage where she kept her cars. I'll also tell you the incredible story of this sleek and mysterious automobile called the Phantom Corsair, designed by a man who could see into the future. You know, many people believe that automobiles and houses have a mysterious, independent life of their own. Perhaps you yourself have experienced a home with some haunting memories, or have owned a car that had a personality all its own. There are individual cars all around the world with stories that strain the imagination. And with the help of some good friends of mine, we'll share with you some mysterious stories. He was the tycoon of a gambling and hotel empire and loved beautiful cars. Bill spent the last 25 years of his life amassing the largest collection in the world. And this 1911 Maxwell was the beauty that got him started on a collection that filled three showrooms with over 1,500 extraordinary automobiles. If Bill Hara hadn't pursued his extravagant hobby, much automobile history would have been lost forever. But here's where the mystery comes in. When he died in 1978, he left no plans for keeping his marvelous collection intact. Now, you would think after spending millions of dollars, he would have wanted to preserve it. Some say he was so possessed by the collection itself that it never occurred to him that anyone would dare to dismantle it after his death. Although some of the cars were sold off, fortunately, the city of Reno has stepped in to help save much of this world-famous collection. And we're about to tell you the story of some of its outstanding showpieces. But before we do, let's go back, all the way back, to the origin of the automobile. Think Henry Ford invented the automobile? Not a ghost of a chance. This is the first internal combustion engine motor car, built by Frenchman Etienne Lenoir in 1863. But he only built one, and it was never patented. In 1875, an Austrian named Siegfried Marcus stated publicly that his motorized invention was a waste of time and money. Marcus would pursue it no further. Carl Benz, however, wanted to build and sell his three-wheeled motor car, and by 1895 was selling 135 of his automobiles per year all over Europe. His vehicle was practical and successful, which is why Carl Benz is recognized as inventing the first automobile. Curiously, fellow German Gottlieb Daimler was developing his version of the automobile only 60 miles from Benz but they had never met or even heard of each other. Eventually, following 40 years of bitter rivalry, Benz and Daimler would merge their companies into one powerful automotive entity. Daimler's development of racing cars with their advanced engine and chassis technology produced the top three winners in the 1914 French Grand Prix. One of the cars was shipped to America, where it won the 1915 Indianapolis 500 race. The spirits of Carl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler continue to speak to today's international automotive industry. This 1907 Thomas Touring Car is one of the favorites here at Harris. She's referred to as Blondie. The manufacturer, E.R. Thomas of Buffalo, New York, bragged about how fast his cars would go. Now just suppose we strip this beautiful automobile of her top and all dead weight and make a race car out of her. Now just imagine. Well, Linda, we don't have to imagine because it actually happened, and this is the car. This is a 1907 Thomas Flyer. On February 12, 1908, this American-built car, along with three French cars, one Italian, and one German car, began what was to be the most incredible endurance race in history. It was the round-the-world New York to Paris automobile race, and this Thomas Flyer was a late entry. Little was done to modify it for the race. Oh, they did add 12-inch wooden planks to replace the fenders for 
mud and snow. And you have to keep in mind that there were no super highways back then. Day after day, the going got pretty tough. The voices of 50,000 spectators ring in the ears of the contestants as they spirited their cars westward from New York's Times Square. They lurched and jerked their way through Buffalo, Cleveland, Toledo, and Chicago. Deep and drifting snow made the travel treacherous. West of Chicago, the snow turned to rain and mired the racers in ruts of mud. Almost six weeks later, the contestants arrived in San Francisco. But the ghastly elements had claimed two of the six starters. The U.S. Flyer, Italian Zust, French De Leon, and German Protos all boarded ships, heading to continue their race in Japan. But having never seen cars before, the Japanese spectators actually slowed the pace of the race down. In the far east of Asia, the drivers found no roads at all. The flyer straddled the tracks of the winding Trans-Siberian Railway, putting a tremendous strain on the car. Breakdowns along the way called for ingenious repairs and took the flyer to the brink of failure. But finally, the weary and worn crew and car arrived in Paris, triumphantly driving down the Champs-Élysées on July 30, 1908. In 171 days, the flyer had traveled 13,341 grueling land miles to victory. I've been telling you about uh, Sarah Winchester and her house, but this program is mostly about mysterious automobiles. Sarah owned three, a Renault, a Buick, and a Pierce Arrow. Her contribution to automotive technology is one of great significance, and I'll tell you about it later in the program. She bought a Pierce Arrow in 1911, the same year the Indianapolis 500 began. And here to tell us about some Indianapolis cars with strange and unusual stories is the voice of the Indianapolis 500, Paul Page. This is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum. It is here where they house the great racing cars of the decades and pay tribute to the men who drove them. There are many myths and legends connected with the unrelenting quest for speed. It was a mystery to many how the Marmon Wasp became the first car to win the very first 500-mile race back in 1911. Driven by Ray Haroon, it was dubbed unsafe and unreliable because it was a single-seater, the only one of its kind in that first race. It won with an average speed of 74 and a half miles an hour. Every tale that is told about these mysterious and powerful machines contains a dose of the unusual, even the bizarre. In racing, death is a constant passenger. Only the most daring and skilled driver can take a car to the limit and avoid disaster. But there was one car that even the best could not tame. The mystery surrounding the Bose Seal Fast Special continues even today. In 1935, a driver named Johnny Hannon had been hired by car owner Leon DeRay to make his debut at Indianapolis by driving number 45. Although a rookie, Hannon's previous accomplishments had given him the credibility to run at Indy. He felt confident that he was going to win the 500 this first time out. It was never to happen. During his first practice run, Hannon never appeared through the fourth turn. No one had reported seeing the car stop on the track. In fact, the car was nowhere in sight. Finally, DeRay found fresh skid marks in turn three. As he looked over the wall, he was shocked to discover his damaged race car sitting upright on the edge of a cornfield. Hannon was dead, his riding mechanics severely injured. Hannon's quest for instant speed had brought him to a swift meeting with death. That one incident, however, was not to be the end of the mystery and tragedy surrounding number 45. Only six days later, veteran driver Clay Weatherly qualified the car for the ninth row. Here's where the story becomes almost bizarre. On the 10th lap, Weatherly, like Hannon before him, lost control of the machine and crashed. He died instantly, and his riding mechanic was also killed. The tragedy put a pall on the running of the 1935 race. As the mystery surrounding this death car intensified, what prompted both drivers to lose control? Was foul play involved? Was the car jinxed? 
Why wasn't it pulled from the race after the first fatality? Well, today, these questions still go unanswered, but the story does not end here. In 1936, this infamous car was back in the lineup, driven by a young Frenchman named Cliff Berger. Why any driver would accept a ride in the same machine that had killed three of his colleagues within nine days of each other is unknown. But because Berger did, the jinx that had haunted the Bose Seal Fast Special was now broken. The 1936 driver of Leon Duray's death car did not win the race that year. But unlike his predecessors, he did live to tell about it. I'm Paul Page. Those are real bullet holes. And this car once belonged to two of the most notorious bank robbers and murderers of the 1930s, Bonnie and Clyde. And here's Bonnie Parker herself to tell us the real story. Thanks a lot, Jan. I'm really glad I'm not Bonnie Parker because this is the very car she and Clyde Barrow were driving when they were ambushed by the law. This is the authentic Bonnie and Clyde death car. You might say it was the last ride for Bonnie and Clyde. The truth is, they were lovers in crime who paid a heavy price for defying the law. Bonnie Parker was from a comfortable, middle-class family in a suburb of Dallas. She didn't have to steal. On the other hand, Clyde Barrow was a sharecropper's son who, by 1932, was establishing a reputation as a car thief, bank robber, and cold-blooded killer of a dozen men. Then he met Bonnie Parker, who was bored with being a waitress and eager for action. The two of them went on a ruthless crime spree that shocked law-abiding citizens in five states. While waiting on a side road outside Grapevine, Texas for other members of their gang, Clyde and his cigar-smoking mall, Bonnie, viciously gunned down two state troopers. It was these atrocious murders that sealed their doom. Outraged, Dallas County Sheriff Newt Smith said to his deputies, Bob Alcorn and Ted Hinton, I want those two and I don't care what you have to do to get them. Alcorn was the only lawman who could identify them. And on May 23rd, 1934, after a year of pursuit, a tip-off sent him and five other peace officers to a rural area just outside of Arcadia, Louisiana, where they set their trap and waited for the vicious pair to show up. Their patience paid off. At 8.30 in the morning, a 1934 four-door Ford sedan rumbled down the country road directly into the lawman's gun sights. Alcorn was quick to identify Clyde Barrow. He waited until the last possible moment, then yelled, That's him, for sure. The six lawmen stood and fired. 160 bullets ripped through the car door, passing through both Clyde and Bonnie, exiting through the other door. The officers weren't taking any chances. They intended to stop them cold, and they did. Found in the car was Clyde's arsenal of two sawed-off shotguns, two machine guns, 10 automatic pistols, and 1,500 rounds of ammunition. They were young and in love and quick on the trigger. But in the end, Bonnie and Clyde died as they lived, by the gun. Bonnie and Clyde, ghosts from the bullets of guns. Perhaps guns made by Winchester? Exploring the strange Victorian mansion that Sarah Winchester built is no easy task. You really have to begin here in this plain little room. It's the seance room, and it's the heart of the house, surrounded by a confusing maze of 160 rooms. It's said that Sarah Winchester was a woman driven by guilt and the terror of vengeance from beyond the grave. The tragic deaths of her infant daughter and husband forced her to consult a medium who convinced her that her whole family had been cursed by the souls of those who had been murdered by the Winchester rifle. And there was only one chance for salvation. She must move west and construct a house that would never be finished. Only then could she placate the spirits and achieve eternal life. According to legend, Sarah came to this room each night between the hours of midnight and 2 a.m. She summoned her ghostly accusers. They gave her the mythical commands for building her house. Then each day she gave orders to her army of carpenters who worked unceasingly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 38 years. There are rooms that are literally built around each other. Priceless Tiffany stained glass windows look out on inner walls or are completely hidden in closets. The stairways can be treacherous. They twist and turn, leading back to where you started. Here are a series of steps that lead mysteriously to the ceiling and stop. 
only a ghost could get to the upper floor. The storage space in closets and cupboards can vary from the size of a three-room apartment to only one inch. You never know what you'll find when you open a door. In this case, it's a blank wall. Here the first step can kill you. It's a one-story drop. There's no question about it. This is the house that Gilt built. And with its bell towers, weather vane, turrets, gables, skylights, and Victorian gingerbread, believe me, there's nothing like it in all the world. A person could disappear behind these walls and never be heard of again. That door won't open, and there's no floor behind this door. How am I going to get out of here? When I started Batman, I used to get out of situations more dangerous than this. It's as easy as saying, holy ghosts. I'm sure you've gathered by now that Sarah Winchester was more than a little eccentric. Actually, it goes even deeper. She zealously guarded her privacy. Uninvited guests were unwelcome, and that even included the President of the United States who tried to get through these front doors and failed. In 1903, Teddy Roosevelt was visiting the area and was curious to see the outlandish Winchester house that he'd heard so much about. So he paid a surprise visit, but Sarah refused to see him. So he got back into his official carriage and returned to Washington without saying a word. Horse-drawn presidential carriages lost their usefulness along about uh, 1909. To tell us more from the Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village, Michigan, is the lovely Eleanor Mondale. Thanks, Adam. You know, this is the very same carriage that President Roosevelt used riding away from Sarah Winchester's house. Teddy Roosevelt was a very skilled rider, and he loved beautiful horses. The thoroughbreds that pulled this rig were considered the finest in the country. Perhaps that's why there were no motor cars in the White House. Then in 1909, President William Howard Taft finally changed the stables into a garage. He purchased the first four cars in the presidential fleet, a white steamer, two Pierce Arrows, and a Baker Electric. Both the president and his lady were mad for motor cars. In President Taft's time, the cars were bought outright. In contrast, the cars of Franklin Delano Roosevelt were especially built for him like this 1939 Lincoln convertible nicknamed the Sunshine Special. It was shipped around the world to such exotic places as Casablanca and Yalta. During World War II, protective armor was added, including a compartment for firearms and submachine guns to protect FDR from assassins. The next president, Harry S. Truman, retired it in 1950 in favor of this up-to-the-minute Lincoln Cosmopolitan. Unlike the ready-made models, this car has enough headroom for even the tallest top hat. President Eisenhower is responsible for adding the clear plastic bubble top over the back seat of the car. He liked being visible to the crowds while still feeling protected. Of all the presidential vehicles, this elongated 1961 Lincoln Continental remains at the center of one of the greatest mysteries in American history. This is the car which President Kennedy was riding in the day he was assassinated. Controversy has raged ever since on the true circumstances behind his brutal murder, but loss of evidence and disappearing witnesses have ensured the impossibility of formal prosecution. The car was more luxurious and contained more special features than any other automobile used at the White House. After the tragic events of November 22, 1963, President Johnson had the limousine sent back to Detroit for remodeling. When it rejoined the official fleet in 1964, the presidential continental had undergone a somber transformation. It contained enough armor plating to resist a landmine and weighed more than five tons. Even so, LBJ was always uneasy when he rode in it. The car remained in use for Presidents Nixon and Ford. Then when Jimmy Carter became president and my father vice president, they retired the car here at the Henry Ford Museum. Teddy Roosevelt wasn't the only person snubbed by Mrs. Winchester. As time went on, she retreated further and further from public view until the only two people she saw were her butler and her secretary. Still, she avidly directed the construction on her house, inventing new ways to make her estate function more efficiently. This call box to summon her servants was one of her many extraordinary inventions. 
This storage room is stacked with priceless wall coverings, costly veneers and masterpieces in stained glass. Her delicate stained glass windows were designed by Tiffany's of New York. On the rare occasions when she left the house, Sarah rode like a queen in a splendid chauffeur-driven Pierce Arrow that reflected her exquisite taste. Exploring the Winchester house lost in luxurious surroundings such as this magnificent grand ballroom. Can you see yourself dancing across this elegant parquet floor above a silver chandelier with a magical number of 13 candles? Sarah could. She decided to give a ball soon after the room was completed. A gourmet supper was served off golden plates with rare wines sparkling in crystal goblets. Tuxedoed musicians played, and the butler formally announced the name of each arriving guest. Except there were no guests, and Sarah danced through the evening alone. Oh, if you're eccentric, it helps to be rich. On the morning of September 5th, 1922, the round-the-clock work on this incredible house stopped. Sarah Winchester had died quietly in her sleep. Now she too travels with the spirits. Her most surprising legacy, it's in the garage. I'll show you. Sarah installed this oil-burning cast iron stove. The stove heated the water in this galvanized tank, which was fed up into the ceiling to this deceptively simple device consisting of a pipe and a rotating nozzle. It created a spray of cascading water. You see, Sarah invented the first car wash. One wonders what she would have thought of the automobiles we drive today with their advanced safety features, sophisticated emission controls and computers. Our high-tech world would probably boggle her imagination. Technology keeps changing every day, and the luxury car of today quickly becomes the museum piece of tomorrow. This Los Long Silhouette Buick Wide Job is a museum piece, now on display at the Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village, Michigan. But back in 1938, when GM first built it, this was the most futuristic automobile ever to come out of Detroit. The smooth contours and concealed headlights show the first attempt at aerodynamic efficiency. It was designed by the legendary Harley Earl, who inspired the GM styling department for 30 years, from the early 1930s through 1958. Many cars that started out on the drawing board went on to become classics, like this successful forerunner of the Ford Mustang, the fantastic turbine engine Chrysler, the Ford X100, or the exciting and still awesome 1958 Firebird II. Looking back with a 1990s perspective, the 1950s were a prosperous, secure, and wonderfully optimistic time. A technology-enriched future of space travel, jet airplanes, and computers seemed just around the corner, and everybody really believed that what was good for General Motors was good for America. GM responded to all of this by building some of the loveliest fantasy cars ever imagined and going on tour with a splashy, spectacular road show called Motorama. It lasted from 1953 until 1961. Recently, a number of Motorama survivor vehicles were gathered at an exclusive Concourse d'Elegance in Pebble Beach, California. Joe Bortz of Highland Park, Illinois, was among the collectors who brought their elegant automotive art objects. This 1954 Pontiac Bonneville Special is one of his prized possessions. With its sleek sports car styling, fiberglass body, and short 100-inch wheelbase, the incomparable Harley Earl was the designer responsible for its timeless good looks. Of all his fascinating chrome trim creations, the dazzling 1951 Buick LeSabre is his most magnificent. It has everything the car owner of the 50s could wish for. A beautiful long, low silhouette, wide wraparound windshield, and fantastic fantail fins that influenced every other car that came after it in the 1950s, including this extraordinary 1959 Cadillac Cyclone. This automotive work of art was not only designed by the great Harley Earl, it was his personal car. But GM wasn't the only car company influenced by future space travel. This streamlined Chrysler looks as if it could fly, even when standing still. And so does this beautifully restored Plymouth. Every car in this Concourse d'Elegance has been shined and polished beyond mint condition. There were also foreign builders who developed some fascinating experimental cars. The futuristic bat cars are among the most exciting. 
Seeing all three of the bat cars on parade, along with the long list of dream cars of Motorama, is a rare treat for anyone who loves automobiles. This is a 1954 Chrysler automobile. Kind of an interesting car, although the owner was even more interesting. He was Howard Hughes. Now, the windows in this car were hermetically sealed, with the exception of the driver's door. Now, why would Howard do that? Well, because he loved clean air. He actually built an air pollution system in the back of this car that fed into the automobile, and it cost more than the car itself. This 1931 Bugatti Royale is a dream car for the rich and pampered. Experts estimate its value at more than $10 million. Only six of these Bugattis were ever made, and its fine artistry and detail is reflected in its craftsmanship. One of the largest passenger cars ever made, this 20-foot Bugatti is powered by a 300-horsepower straight-eight engine. This masterpiece was supposedly built for the King of Romania, but eventually made its way to France. In order to avoid capture or destruction by the Nazis in World War II, it was hidden in the sewers of Paris until after the war. Bill Hera acquired the car and made it part of his collection in 1964. This car is to automobiles what the Hope Diamond is to jewelry. These beautiful and sometimes haunting works of art are from the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art and they depict both the abstract and traditional visions of the automobile from the artist's eye. With pieces by Salvador Dali, Picasso, and Matisse, the exhibit shows everything from fleeting fantasy to the stark reality of cars and their influence on society. While well, everyone sees something different in these works in the form of paintings, photos, and sculptures, they all agree that they reflect the automobile's gift of convenience, joy, and sometimes tragedy. In the late 1930s, the Winchester House was closed. People feared that the place was haunted. At the same time, this mysterious car was being built. Come to think of it, both the house and the car have a lot in common. They're beautiful and they're mysterious, and they have stories involving bizarre twists of fate. The car, called the Phantom Corsair, may even be haunted. The two men who loved it the most both died in tragic car crashes. But that's only part of the story. It all began back in 1936 with a 23-year-old Yale dropout named Rust Hines. He was the heir to the famous ketchup and pickle fortune. You know, the 57 varieties, folks. He was obsessed with his dreams of a futuristic vision he called the Phantom Corsair. His family in Pittsburgh wanted him to grow up and take over the factory, but Rust was determined to make his dream a reality. Fortunately for him, two car builders from Pasadena, California, named Bowman and Schwartz, were smart enough to recognize real genius when they saw it. They willingly provided the practical expertise Rust needed. The car breezed through all the tests in a specially constructed wind tunnel and was soon ready for full-scale construction. Nothing like the Phantom Corsair had ever been seen before. The soaring lines of its full envelope aluminum body seemed to be moving even when standing still. It was strictly Buck Rogers. The fog lights were built in with chrome line tunnels that reflected light to the sides of the car. Wraparound steel bumpers were controlled hydraulically. The doors opened electrically, and little wings raised the roof, making it easier to enter. The dashboard gadgets monitor everything from oil pressure to altitude. And most importantly, the entire interior was packed with cork paneling. The emphasis was on safety and comfort. The Phantom Corsair was far ahead of its time, but unfortunately time had run out for young Rust Hines. On the way to the first public showing of his beloved Phantom Corsair, he was killed in an automobile accident driving another car. His hopes for marketing his Phantom were tragically ended. Still, the car has endured. It starred opposite Paulette Goddard and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. in the 1939 film, Young at Heart, portraying a mysterious vehicle called the Flying Wombat. The Phantom Corsair was sold to a number of owners during the years that followed. Then in 1951, it was bought by comedian Herb Schreiner, who shared the same love for this amazing vehicle that Rust Hines once had. Schreiner, too, was killed in an automobile accident while driving another car. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Perhaps both would still be alive if only they'd been driving the Phantom Corsair. 
The car remains an enduring monument to a young man's dream. Another young man who had a dream was Preston Tucker, whose Tucker Torpedo was considered to be the most revolutionary car of its time. In fact, it was too revolutionary. This futuristic car was the brainchild of Preston Tucker, born in Michigan in 1903. After working for Ford, Cadillac, and Pierce Arrow, Tucker's first innovative design was the combat car built during World War II. This vehicle could travel at speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour, but it was the gun turret that secured Tucker a government contract. His real dream was to build a car that would revolutionize the auto industry. He fought hard to obtain financial backing and soon formed the Tucker Corporation. He made plans to produce a car with a rear-mounted engine, fluid drive, a safety chamber for the car's occupants, pop-out safety glass, and an engine powerful enough to safely cruise at more than 100 miles per hour. The prototype was introduced and the word was in. The Tucker Torpedo was the car to own. Dealerships were set up, orders began to arrive, and a 2200 employee plant was opened on Chicago's south side. Against all odds, Preston Tucker had taken on the Big Three of Detroit and succeeded. Early production units of the Torpedo showed them to be sturdy and dependable vehicles, and Tucker had captured America's eye. But the shadow of gloom descended over the Tucker success story. There was talk of financial wrongdoing in securing the backing to build the Tucker, leading to criminal charges of mail fraud and federal securities violations. Preston Tucker fought the accusations and was successful in being acquitted in January of 1950. But the court case had seriously tapped his finances and dealt a death blow to his automobile company as it was filed for bankruptcy. The car that was perhaps destined for greatness became only a specter of what it could have been. Only 51 Tuckers were ever built. Preston Tucker's cousin, Frank Tucker, fondly remembers the car maker's dream. It came to my knowledge that Preston wanted to build a car was about 1941 or 42. Um, he had a, a, a artist book of artist conception of the car he wanted to build one day. And the reason I remember it is because, not the obvious reason, but each drawing had a Sullivan page, I remember. I was about 14 years old at the time. and. Uh, uh, so I knew that long ago that Preston someday wanted to build a car. There are people that uh, will tell you that the Big Three didn't have anything to do with Preston's demise, but uh, I truthfully believe that when he came out with the Tucker car, it was more than they wanted. And in as much as the government was after him and uh, so on, the Big Three just stood in the background. But if, if they would have permitted him to go on with the Tucker, he might have had other problems. That's, that's my belief. I say that if, if you took the Tucker car today and you, you put it next to, in a row with several of our modern automobiles, the Tucker will still turn heads. There's no doubt about it. Amazingly, 46 of the 51 Tuckers remain today, and they still turn heads. One lucky owner is Sharon Vick, who talks about the Tucker's features. The biggest safety feature on the car was the crash chamber, and that's on the passenger side. It's uh, reinforced with steel, and uh, the passenger, when they saw they were going to have a, a wreck, they were to roll down into the crash chamber and be protected. It was the first car to have padded dash. It has pop-out windshields, and they do work. When they were testing the car at the Indianapolis racetrack, um, I believe a tire blew out and the car did roll over and the windshields did pop out like they were supposed to. Uh, the other features it has that aren't necessarily safety, it has a, a rack over the back seat where the women were, uh, could put their purchases, their packages, their groceries, and things like that. The, the doors are cut back into the roof, and that was for easy access in and out. It drives really well. We've had, we probably put, oh, two or 3,000 miles on it at least, and uh, it likes to hum along at 80, but you, know, you try and keep it down, and it, it would run at 100 for quite a long time. Preston Tucker and his dream car quickly became, and remains to this day, a part of the American car culture. In 1956, at the age of 53, Preston Tucker was said to have died from a broken heart. 
but his story of imagination and perseverance secured a place for him in the eyes of many. In fact, Preston Tucker influenced one of the world's biggest filmmakers to make his visionary tale into the reality of cinema. It was almost too good to be true. Detroit, they're putting the squeeze on. We can't buy steel, we can't buy anything. So, I made an appointment with Senator Ferguson. Oh, what do you think? A big smile and a pat on the back is gonna make him forget he's a senator from Detroit. Find an idea of yours, selling dealerships for cars that don't exist. What'd he say? He said, stay out of the car business. Tucker built the thing. Well, not everything he advertised, not yet, but enough right now to cost billions just to keep up with it. You don't understand how powerful the forces are that are working against us here. Ever since you road tested the new car, 40 g men have been following you around the clock. What for? To make the car too good. Tucker is the story of a young man's dream, told with Hollywood stars. Stars whose cars have stories of their own to tell. You know, most Hollywood stars love to travel in style, and this man was no different. Those are the immortal sounds of the first superstar of talking pictures, Mr. Al Jolson. And this was his 1933 Cadillac Fleetwood. And as you can see, it's luxury all the way. Truly a great car. A lot of Hollywood stars prefer to own specialty cars. Al Jolson was an all-out kind of performer who loved his automobiles and his audiences. This car has been completely restored. As beautiful as the cars in the Harris collection are, most of them were purchased in rather poor condition and upgraded here. Bill Hara made sure the Jolson car was restored to its original perfection with all the little details. This car only cost $8,000 when it was new, and you had to be a star to afford it back then in 1933, which was right in the middle of the Depression. Now I'm going to tell you the story of two brothers, Fred and Augie Duesenberg. They were car builders in Indianapolis, Indiana, and a lot of the technology and the ideas that they got came from speedway racing. And they would take those ideas and apply them to some of the most magnificent passenger cars ever built. The Duesenbergs were awesome. The Duesenberg Straight A dual overhead cam engine, originally developed for racing, was a legendary performer. In the late 1920s, the Duesenberg company was absorbed into E.L. Cord's growing conglomerate in Auburn, Indiana. It was after this merger that the legendary Model J was born. Now, needless to say, the Model J Duesenberg was a hot item in Hollywood. Everybody wanted one. James Cagney had one. Billy Rose, the great producer, had one. And this one, this Model J Duesenberg, was owned by the great screen legend, Clark Gable. And here to tell us a little bit more about Clark Gable and this fine automobile is the director of the Bering Automobile Museum, Skip Marchetti. Skip, welcome to the show. Hi, Jan. Thank you for inviting me. Let's talk a little bit about this uh, Clark Gable Duesenberg here, quite an automobile. Yes. Now, Clark Gable not only liked to drive these cars, but sort of a relaxation thing. He really liked to work on these cars. Yes. He and his good friend Gary Cooper were uh, uh, rivals on screen and uh, also rivals in the automobile hobby. Uh, they both owned Duesenbergs. They both raced them at uh, Muroc Dry Lake. and. Um, they both like to work on their cars. This one in particular uh, was designed by uh, Clark Gable with the help of a uh, uh, stylist at Bowman and Schwartz Corporation, uh, W. Everett Miller. Uh, Clark had a lot of input in the style of the car, the swoopy fenders, the laid back windshield, the dual rear mounted spares, which legend has that uh, he wanted the spares on the rear so that he could uh, easily work on the engine without uh, having to work over the side mount spares. So. Now Skip brings up a good point. Uh, Bowman and Schwartz were car builders here in California. What's interesting about that is is that the Duesenberg brothers back in Indianapolis only built the chassis, then sent them out to a variety of different coach builders throughout the United States. That's correct. Bowman and Schwartz was, were the coach builders to the stars in uh, Pasadena, California. They were a, uh, a company that took over the coach building trade from Murphy of Pasadena. Murphy was a, a, an earlier company. Bo both Mr. Bowman and Mr. Schwartz had worked for Murphy Corporation in Pasadena and took over the company upon uh, Walter Murphy's death. Um, they built some of the finest, most beautiful uh, automobile creations. Uh, most, uh, most of the Duesenberg bodies, I say the most prolific Duesenberg bodies were, were uh, uh, Murphy's 
and then later Bowman and Schwartz. This would mean too then that no two were ever alike? Never. Uh, all Duesenberg uh, coach work was uh, uh, dissimilar in some way. Uh, they had owner's input for uh, uh, details like upholstery, uh, uh, how the windshield slanted, uh, various things like this. It was, it was a true coach-built automobile. Now these cars were very big, very heavy, but they were very powerful and extremely fast. And these particular cars had a first. They had a monitoring system in them. Yeah, the monitoring system uh, monitored uh, the uh, chassis lubrication, which was uh, automatically lubricated about every 50 miles. Uh, the uh, uh, when to uh, add water to your battery and, and two other, other similar functions. They were uh, electrically actuated uh, red and green lights on either side of the dashboard. Now this car also played a role in the affair of Carol Lombard and Clark Gable, did yes. it not? Yes, uh, it was a central part of their affair. Uh, Clark Gable and uh, the beautiful Carol Lombard uh, went on several excursions in, in this beautiful automobile. And unfortunately after her death in, uh, uh, during World War II, um, Clark stopped driving the car and uh, put the car away and it was uh, uh, not driven by him uh, ever again. If a man can bridge the gap between life and death, I mean, if he can live on after he's dead, then maybe he was a great man. James Dean said that, and perhaps he knew something about the future, because he became even a greater star after he was killed in an automobile accident in 1955. But James Dean was different. He had a unique style, all his own. And back in the 50s, everyone wanted to be just like James Dean. He was the kind of guy who marched to a different drummer. James Dean was one movie star who always seemed real to us. We could relate to him. He came from the bright lights of Broadway to Hollywood and made only three films in his short career. East of Eden, Giant, and his most popular film, Rebel Without a Cause, which co-starred Natalie Wood, Sal Mineo, and this 1949 two-door Mercury Coupe. In fact, this car was the inspiration for the first of the custom car designers. They'd take off all the excess chrome to give it a sleeker look. It was called nosing and decking. All things considered, I'd say this 1949 Mercury was the perfect choice when Warner Brothers needed a hot car to co-star with James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. Elvis Aaron Presley was the king of rock and roll. He filled Graceland with hundreds of big boy toys, and his love of fancy and exotic cars was no exception. One Memphis auto dealer recalls selling more than 100 luxury cars to the king. Along with this pink Cadillac, Elvis loved this white limo, equipped with all the comforts, including gold-trimmed interior, a small bar, a refrigerator, and TV set. His vast collection of amazing automobiles proved just one thing. Elvis sure knew how to party. Let's have a party. Let's have a party. Let's have a party. Let's do the stories. Why some more or less? Have a party. Do not be like going to have a party tonight. In the Hollywood, anything is possible. Well, that's true. And of course, automobiles do take on a personality all their own. There are cars that can think, automobiles that can talk. Classic example is the Kit car that you saw with David Hasselhoff and the TV series Knight Rider. Kit will talk to everybody. That's right, Jan. I love to welcome people here to the Universal Studios tour, and I'll talk to everybody. I'm located right next to the new Star Trek exhibit. As for my name, Kit, that stands for Night Industries 2000. I was on the television show Knight Rider. David Hasselhoff, who played Michael Knight, drove me to fame. We were together on network television for four years. What makes me so special is I am an ultra-advanced computer and built with enough high-tech devices to make even RoboCop jealous. I'm programmed to save human lives. I can also trace phone calls, monitor action through a built-in television camera, detect nearby explosives, and of course, play video games in my spare time. I can attain speeds in excess of 300 miles an hour. My sleek body style is molded in the shape of a 1980 Trans Am Firebird and is made of super plasteel, which is even stronger than the heat tiles on the U.S. Space Shuttle. This makes me virtually indestructible. And here it is, 
a real favorite of Steven Spielberg's. He used it in his hit movie, Back to the Future, a real box office smash. While you're on your Universal Studios tour, you'll see many of the sets from that movie, including the clock tower that was struck by lightning, which eventually enabled Michael J. Fox and his time machine to get back home. And this is the machine he did it in, a really zapped up DeLorean. But this is Hollywood, where reality is in the script. According to Dr. Emmett Brown, the whacked out scientist played by Christopher Lloyd in Back to the Future, the secret of time travel lies in the flux capacitator, a computerized graphic gizmo that looks a little like a divining rod. The energy converter on the back of the car takes in plutonium and creates a nuclear reaction. Then you're on your way. And oh, don't forget that extra supply of plutonium for the return trip. I'm in North Hollywood at J. Orberg Star Cars. Now, Jay has managed to amass and accumulate the biggest collection of television and movie cars in the world. Cars with personalities, like this, the longest convertible limousine in the world. Built out of a Mercedes or two, it's over 40 feet long. And yet behind me here is a bar, and behind that is a heart-shaped hot tub. Just the thing you need to go driving around town. This is quite a collection, and let's take a close-up look at it right now. Jay Orberg has built and accumulated over 175 famous cars, and I'm sure you recognize the Pac-Man rod. Now, much like Pac-Man, this vehicle turns when you least expect it, and I think you put the quarters right down here in these slots. Now, I've got another famous car right over here. On the Universal lot, there's a pretty famous address, 1313 Mockingbird Lane, the Munsters. And out in front, you saw this car parked a lot. When they were driving it, Fred Gwynn was right behind the wheel there who played Herman. And way in the back sat Yvonne DiCarlo who played Lily. And they certainly had lots of horsepower to work with. Let's move into the science fiction category now. From the famous movie Blade Runner, this car is almost a cult hero. It was driven by Harrison Ford. And it's a super cop car that could not only run down the bad guys on the highway, but if it needed to, it could fly over them and catch them. The earliest images that came from Hollywood screen proved that filmmakers knew how to make a scene exciting. Use a car. Whether it was tumbling, crashing, skidding, burning, or bashing, Tinseltown quickly learned that it took a special breed of driver to make an auto scene spectacular. So was born the stunt driver. The task was to crash the car, make it look real, and hopefully walk away to do it one more time. As time went on, some movies featured the automobile as the center of attention. One such film was the 1977 thriller aptly entitled The Car. Effects teams built five identical cars, only to see them filmed and destroyed. One exciting stunt called for the auto to skid and roll five times, finally tumbling right over the sheriff and his deputy. Precision timing and steel nerves, along with accurate planning, led to a successful and spectacular bit. The 1986 critically acclaimed hit directed by Rob Reiner, Stand By Me, called for stunt driver Brian Carson to fill in for Kiefer Sutherland. Carson's perfect timing created a white-knuckle ride as he avoided a head-on collision in a 1950 Ford. The lumber truck swerved right on cue and the meticulous planning paid off. Carson was once again called into service, this time in 1985's Crime Wave. Set in Detroit, his cars ran from behind on a highway as fiery pyrotechnics add to the realism. It seems that man has always liked to dance with the demons, perhaps with a touch of insanity. It may be a death wish or just the sparkle of fame and fortune. For whatever reason, there have always been audiences to watch these thrill seekers take on the specter of death. The first stunt drivers were the International Congress of Daredevils. Soon, Lucky Teeter, king of the Daredevils, created a show of precision driving that was designed to thrill fans. But after a jump led to a fatal crash, his became a ghost car. Lucky Locke was famous for endless rolls in his auto, but he also defied death by crashing into flaming walls. However, daredevil Jimmy Lynch met the Grim Reaper in a ramp-to-ramp -ramp jump. The Chitwood family still thrills audiences today. 
Professional stunt driver Brian Carson began his career in the early 70s doing dive bomber crashes and barrel rolls at local fairgrounds across America. Some competitions pitted one driver against another, with the grand prize going to the one who could roll their car the most times. Carson progressed to sidewinder rolls and bus jumps, all the time keeping one step ahead of becoming a mere memory. Today, Brian Carson, along with his movie stunt driving, thrills crowds by heading his ghost cars square into the fiery face of death. Although many concept, idea, and dream cars have been produced over the last half century, very few remain. Most were destroyed by the manufacturers. It was their way of protecting their secrets. That makes these cars here at the Bering Automobile Museum that much more important. These cars are truly works of art, as finely crafted as any piece of sculpture. This is a 1953 Chrysler Special designed by Virgil Exner. The Chrysler Special was powered by a 180 horsepower Hemi V8 engine. A lot of styling elements such as the grille, wheel arches and roof line were later used in production models. The body of this car was produced by Ghia. Giacinto Ghia began his career as an apprentice to an Italian carriage maker at the turn of the century. By the 1920s, Ghia and his partner were building car coaches for a large and illustrious clientele. The 1953 Fiat Supersonic was also built at the Ghia factory. The actress Lana Turner once owned one of these cars. The body style used on the Supersonic was later adapted to other vehicles, like this 1954 DeSoto Adventure II. The DeSoto was highly accessorized. It had electric windows, an electric power sliding rear window, a radio, heater, and a matching two-piece set of luggage. After the Corvette was introduced in 1953, other companies began to investigate producing fiberglass sports cars. Take a look at this 1954 Plymouth Belmont built by Briggs. It debuted at the 1954 St. Louis Auto Show. This is a 1962 Aston Martin with a body by Zagato. It is one of only 19 ever built. The Italian coachwork is very shapely. Today's aerodynamics is an accepted part of car design, but back in the 1950s, this was not necessarily the case. In 1955, when this Ghia Coupe known as Gilda was produced, it caused an international shiver. The car is constructed of lightweight aluminum and mounted on a tubular frame. This car, built in 1958, established the British manufacturer Jaguar as a performance leader. This model is unique because of its Italian Bertone body. The engine incorporates a special high-performance head design and an extra carburetor for extra horsepower. And this is the car that ushered Jaguar into the 1960s, the legendary E-Type. Its profile made it an instant classic, as did its V10 engine. This car remains at the top of the list of Jaguar collectors. From the grille to the taillights, it's perfection in design. This 1962 Dual Ghia is truly a car of the stars. Dual Motors only produced about a hundred of these cars. Highly sought after in Hollywood, their owners included Frank Sinatra, Peter Lawford, and Eddie Fisher. This Corvette show car was built in 1964, one year after the introduction of the Stingray. Fifteen coats of candy apple red lacquer were applied over a gold base to achieve this spectacular finish. The enlarged grille and altered hood would later be used in the 1965 through 67 styling. Note the unique side exhaust and dual sport mirrors. The mirrors eventually became a factory option. The Corvette's fuel-injected engine was chrome-plated for the show. This show car was displayed at the Detroit Auto Show and the New York World's Fair. From the time production began 40 years ago right up to today, the Corvette has represented some of the most advanced automotive styling. This one-off Chrysler show car was built in 1967. It is called the Dodge Deru. The name is derived from an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning dart, and it's no coincidence that this car was built on a Dodge Dart chassis. And in case you're curious, there really is a ghost car. This 1940 see-through Pontiac was one of the top attractions at the 1939 New York World's Fair. Produced at a cost of $25,000, the ghost car's body was made of the then revolutionary materials of plexiglass and lucite. Two versions of the clear plastic car were made in 1939, and one is actually still in existence today. Perhaps someday it'll make a ghost appearance in your neighborhood. I hope you've enjoyed probing into the mysteries behind these fabulous cars as much as I have. Not every automobile comes with a mystery attached to it, but they do all have the power to transport us wherever we want to go with speed and comfort. I hope that you'll give them the respect they deserve, keep your eyes and ears open, and drive safely. Now, for all of us here on the program, I'd like to say thanks for looking in.